Call Me By Your Name ends with a long shot of Elio staring into a fire, feeling his pain and not turning away from it. The camera, likewise, refuses to cut away from his face, making us feel his pain for a long time. The title comes on, announcing that this whole film has been a cold open, a prelude to a realization. And as the credits roll, we still don't cut away. It's a bold ending that stays with us. But throughout this story of young, intense love between Elio and his father's American graduate student, Oliver, director Luca Guadagnino is following through on this same philosophy of the closing scene, the philosophy of not cutting away from our feelings. Through his camera style, Guadagnino visually makes us feel what Elio does, and he won't let us escape, especially not when it's uncomfortable. We can't cut away when Elio is waiting in anticipation, hoping that Oliver will come into his room, and he doesn't. When he's having his way with the peach, and later when he has to undergo the shame of Oliver discovering the fruit. Oh, I see. You've moved on to the plant kingdom already. What's next, minerals? I suppose you've already given up animals. You know that's me. In the key scene when Elio is finally trying to admit his feelings to Oliver in the town square, the camera is uncomfortably far away from the characters, not cutting in close for that intimate moment we might expect, just as they're uncomfortably far away from each other in a public space for this most private of moments. Why are you telling me this? Because I thought you should know. Because you thought I should know? Even in his moment of confession, Elio finds awkward phrases to tell Oliver how he feels without really saying any of the actual words. And the distance that is in between them, that is symbolized physically by this monument, it's the um, necessary distance that has to be covered for the two of them to finally be united. There's no one else I can say this to but you. Are you saying what I think you're saying? So we're included in how excruciatingly hard this moment is for him. And because we're there with him, we remember how hard those moments are for all of us, especially when we're young especially when it's the first time, especially when we like someone so much with the crazed, paralyzing intensity that Elio feels for Oliver. Throughout the movie, Guadagnino and his DP use only one 35 millimeter lens. The limitation of not switching focal lengths imitates the human eye, which also can't switch between different perspectives in the same moment. So the storytelling is never relying on glib camera techniques to make us feel. Only one lens for everything, for the main titles, for the entire shoot, for the post, for the ending, and there's no, it's one lens. I wanted simplicity, I wanted to be straightforward, I didn't want to create technology in between the, the, the camera and the performances. The consistent camera visually pins us in the place of one person who's present. And this choice subtly builds a very strong emotional impact. We've never been spared Elio's discomfort, so near the end, the pain and beauty of what he's lived hits us in a profound, personal way, as if we're the ones who've lived it. The movie also departs from the novel in some key ways to heighten the immediacy. First of all, it's set in the present, whereas the novel is recalling the past. Feelings are influenced by the passage of time in later developments in Elio's and Oliver's lives over 20 years. Screenwriter James Ivory wrote a third-person voiceover narration into the screenplay, but the final movie leaves this out. So the film is grounded in visceral, visual experience, how characters look, act, and respond in the moment. And from that, we have to decode and perceive for ourselves their unsaid, invisible thoughts and feelings. I try to rely on behavior and the physical space where this behavior happens to unfold. As a side note, because the movie doesn't use all the parts of the novel, that also means we may get more movies about Elio and Oliver. Guaranino said he wants to make sequels. 
is that such an interesting character, you yeah. know, like to see him grow up and to become maybe a great pianist and to understand what will be his interest in sexuality, his interest in emotions, and how they're going to meet again, Oliver and Elio. All this is very interesting, let alone the fact that the book ends with a, a chapter that is like 40 pages long, where you follow the characters for 20 years. In the final scene of the film, the title finally comes up, Call Me By Your Name. And because we're seeing this at the very end, we're able to contemplate the title based on everything we've just seen and ask why the director chooses not to show it until now. The phrase again ties into the don't cut away theme of facing our feelings and ourselves. Call me by your name and I'll call you by mine. The words are a secret language between Elio and Oliver. They say it in bed together. Elio. Oliver uses it to give Elio the gift of his shirt. For Oliver. For Elio. And in their final phone call, when Oliver tells Elio he's getting married, they call each other by their own names once more. Elio, 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 Elio. And then Oliver says, Oliver. I remember the words Call Me By Your Name express the way that falling in love is a mirror into ourselves. The truest love, this kind that comes around only once if ever, is like staring ourselves in the face, in a way that we've probably never done before, in a way that we can't on our own, and in a way that, for these reasons, is incredibly scary. The momentousness of this explains why they're so terrified to act for most of the story. The game of using each other's names is one way of breaking through the barriers of their sexual insecurities. Elio is anxious about exploring his sexuality for the first time in his life, and Oliver understands his desire better, but he's trying very hard to repress it. So as hard as it is for anyone to admit and pursue a true love, it's even harder for them because of the context. It means we can't talk about those kinds of things, okay? We just can't. The act of calling each other by their own names takes on more meaning in the story because it's set in 1983, and Oliver feels that he has to get married and keep up the illusion of heterosexuality. This moment in their lives, thanks to the shelter of Elio's accepting parents, is a rare opportunity to love openly and not hide themselves. Why didn't you give me a sign? I did. You didn't give me a sign. I did. When it went. You remember when we were playing volleyball? And I touched you just to show you that I liked you. The true self that Elio and Oliver see in each other is also their best self. Near the end, Elio tells his father, I think he was better than me. Oh, I think he was better than me. To which his father responds, I'm sure he'd say the same thing about <laughs> you. Hmm? He'd say the same thing. Which flatters you both. Their relationship is based on a deep and mutual admiration and the desire to be more like one another. Elio idolizes the older, more experienced Oliver. He wants to be like Oliver, cool, suave, independent, projecting a happy and carefree persona. He immediately notices Oliver's self-assured confidence. He complains that the casual sign-off later is impolite and arrogant, but then he imitates it with great joy. Just watch, this is how we'll say goodbye to us when the time comes, with his later. <laughs> and he admires Oliver's physical and emotional maturity, which is understandable as Elio's on the edge of adulthood, and the movie is a coming-of-age story. Meanwhile, Oliver wants to be more like Elio. He sees in Elio that freedom he desires but feels he can't have. He admires Elio's budding musical genius. I can't believe you changed it again. Oh, I changed it a little bit. Yeah, why? I just played it the way Buzzoni would have played it if he'd altered Liszt's version. And what is wrong with Bach, the way Bach would have played Bach's Bach? Bach never wrote it for the guitar. In fact, we're not even sure Bach Forget wrote it. Forget I all. asked. Elio's knowledge and profundity. I never even heard of the Battle of Piave. The Battle of Piave is one of the most lethal battles in World War I. 170,000 people die. Is there anything you don't know? And he admires Elio's youthful, unabashed thrill in his sexuality. Even though he's younger and less experienced, Elio is the one who acts on their romantic feelings. 
and Oliver wishes he had Elio's open, accepting European family. You're so lucky. My father would have carted me off to a correctional facility. So over the course of the summer, Elio and Oliver actually become more each other, each taking on these characteristics that they love in the other. And calling each other by their own names is a way of signaling that they're merging, that they are each other. Elio starts wearing his own Star of David after Oliver does. As we saw, he imitates Oliver's sign-off. He joins Oliver in his dance to Love My Way after watching him longingly for quite a while. He wears Oliver's shirt and gets into Oliver's shorts and bathing suit, and he imitates Oliver's mannerisms on more than one occasion before they go for a swim. Visually, at times, we also see them merging. In a voiceover in the screenplay, which isn't included in the film, the narrator says near the end, they had become each other that summer. It goes on to say, they had found the stars, Elio and Oliver, and this is given once only. Call Me By Your Name is the third part of a trilogy about desire, with I Am Love and A Bigger Splash. At the beginning, I thought, oh my God, it's another movie about rich uh, foreign people lounging in the Italian summertime. Right. And I really thought that desire, in a way, is the, is, the, is the force that motivates the characters. And Guadagnino ends his trilogy on a note of self-knowledge. So I, I, I thought that the, the conclusion of a trilogy about desire on a sweet note. So the title coming up at the end is an affirmation that Elio, because of what he's felt, is now fully himself. In a scene near the end, Elio's father beautifully articulates the philosophy that corresponds to the film's don't cut away from the feeling aesthetic. He tells his son, We rip out so much of ourselves to be cured of things faster that we go bankrupt by the age of 30 and have less to offer each time we start with someone new. But to make yourself feel nothing so as not to feel anything what a waste. As we, the viewers, take in this conversation, feeling by then that we've been through all of this ourselves, his advice might awaken in us a renewed determination to face life, even and especially when it's hard. At the end of the movie, yeah, I got a Q&A, someone said to me, oh, don't you think it's sad? I said, no, it's not sad. It's actually joyful because, yeah. the, because Elio becomes a man. So if there's anything this movie teaches us, it's that when we feel the worst pain of our lives, don't cut away from that feeling, because that feeling means we're alive. Right now, there's sorrow, pain. Don't kill it. I'm with it, the joy you felt. Hi guys, Susanna here. We're excited about Guadagnino's plan to do sequels following Elio over time. And we've heard this idea being compared to Francois Truffaut's series about Antoine Duanel. A lot of you probably know of The 400 Blows from 1959, but Truffaut actually made four sequels following the same character as he grew up, all of them starring the iconic Jean-Pierre Léo. The series is a great precursor to the character-driven episodic TV we know and love today. So while you're waiting for more Elio, you could spend a little time getting to know Antoine. If you're new here, please subscribe and support us on Patreon if you're able.